prove it. But most witnesses are filled with terror and dread. She starts screaming. She won't stay out after dark. What emotion do you associate with it? Air. Those who see the lights. I was employed by the Missouri State Highway Patrol. Report strange occurrences. The farther I drove, the closer this light got to me. And they want these terrifying encounters to stop. They're frightened. Some of these people are just scared out of their minds. Oh, whoa, whoa. There, are. there it is. Video evidence seems to show that something is going on that we just don't understand. Wow. Whoa, whoa. But what is it? There is no explanation for it. We have no known source for what is causing it. Is this presence a warning of things to come? This orb stopped three feet from me. And I heard a voice say, don't touch it or you'll die. This is case number 92207, Dark Presence. We investigated balls of light, orbs, last year in Indiana. Guess what? They're back. And this time, we're going to investigate a whole other aspect of the kind of a dark presence. People are reporting a frightening UFO contact that involves nightmares, headaches, terrifying premonitions, and sometimes actual confrontations with the orbs. These spherical UFOs are really nothing new. If you go back into Project Blue Book, there was all kinds of uh, reports of spherical UFOs. This has been going on for a long time, and it, it, it's a huge part of ufology to understand what these balls of light are. The spike in orb sightings is a worldwide phenomenon, from Puerto Rico to Australia. But we're seeing a pattern of reports in Missouri, Indiana, and Arizona for some reason. So we need to investigate this phenomenon and find out what's going on. These orbs aren't necessarily UFOs. There's so many conventional explanations that don't associate with any kind of communication whatsoever. There's conventional and there's unconventional. So I think that's what we need to explore. And we're going to try to get to the bottom of what this presence means. Respected investigator Ted Phillips has been exploring the orb phenomena for two decades and focusing on a particular area in the Ozarks of Missouri that he calls Site X. People are reporting nightmares, animal mutilations, hauntings, and a deep fear of these uninvited guests. People are so frightened by these orbs, they don't want to come forward. Hi, Ted. How are you? Hi, guys. Good to see you. Good to see you. But investigator Ted Phillips has gained the trust of this community, and he's sharing with us some horrible accounts that witnesses have told him. We've had uh, a great deal of new activity in the light bulb area. I wanted to bring along some photos and some video to give you a better idea of what we're talking about. The light balls uh, range in size from baseball to basketball. They all fly around, maneuver, sometimes go into a uh, sort of yo-yo pattern, up and down, and then to the right and the left. And do this for a long, long time. There it is. Wow. Whoa, whoa. I got called Ted, man. The longest duration sighting was over an hour and 30 minutes. So you're eliminating things like uh, uh, gas or earth lights because of the duration. Now recently, more of the objects have been seen on the ground. So there is a little bit of the fear factor. What are the effects on humans? Dry throat. Uh, some nausea, severe headaches, colors in their vision. We've never heard stories like this before from anyone about the interactions of orbs with human beings. So we're looking at a close encounter of the fifth kind here. Wow, that was an awesome. There it is. Ronnie, turn your camera on.
Have there been any fatalities or injuries uh, in relation to these sightings? We had one case, one of the very best, and a little girl's jumping on the trampoline. She sees this close, a light bulb. And she slips and twists her ankle just a bit. She starts screaming. Her mother tells me, said she won't stay out after dark. Has not since it's happened. So the daughter is scared of these things. Oh, yes, she is. The story that Ted is telling us is rather hard to fathom. How could this be happening, and yet the, the media hasn't reported any of this? I'd love to interview this woman that had this confrontation, but Ted says she's just too scared to talk. Are there any deaths that you can ascribe specifically to these objects? We had a case in which the ranch owner and his son were sitting there one afternoon, and they saw a small light bulb. Well, he had his three labs lying on the ground there by him, and the light bulb makes a low pass over the three dogs, gets their attention, and it starts moving away towards a, a small clump of trees. And the dogs follow. And suddenly he hears uh, uh, terrible cries from the dogs. And he runs down there, the light bulb is gone, and he finds the three dogs as three sort of gooey puddles on the ground. The dogs were liquefied? Mm -hmm. This is a community with, with a problem. Where, where do you go when you're being plagued by strange balls of light that are actually making your children cry and also causing harm to plant life and livestock? I think there's an indication in the fact that they, the thing lured the dogs. That puts it into an entirely different realm. What do you think these objects are? The one thing I can tell you is these things are real, whatever they are. So many witnesses seeing the same things, and they are physical. Are we dealing with some kind of malevolent force here? Yeah, I really think, based on what happened, you have to go with uh, malicious intent. This is an incredible video and a story that Ted has shared with us. We have to analyze the video. But interesting to note that just 30 miles away, we have a first-hand account of orbs making nightly visits. And they're also linked to a dark presence. I was employed by the Missouri State Highway Patrol. One night, I noticed this light off to my left. The farther I drove, the closer this light got to me. Doug Schultz is a 31-year veteran of the Missouri Highway Patrol. While on duty, he witnessed a single orb every night for a year. So many residents in the area saw this light that it became known as the North View Light. In December of 1992, I was in Marshville going across the, the uh, exit 100 overpass. I noticed the North View Light off to my left. It was brighter, larger, and closer than I'd ever seen it before. I went west on Highway 38, and the farther I went, the closer this light appeared to get to my patrol car. It was really close, really large, so I decided I was going to stop my car and turn the engine off and see if I could hear this thing. I stood with the door open, got my binoculars out, and I got a good look at this thing. It was probably about a, no more than a quarter of a mile from me, and it was about 80 to 100 feet above the ground, hovering immediately over the county road. My patrol car was equipped with a spotlight, so I decided that I would shine the spotlight on the object uh, just to see what, it, what might happen. As soon as I shined the spotlight on it, this craft, without making any noise, took off and was out of sight in less than a second. A friend of mine lived uh, almost directly below where this light was hovering at the time. Uh, he was a cattle rancher. Uh, we found a dead cow uh, in the farmer's residence. Uh, this particular cow had about an 18-inch incision made in its neck. It also had uh, 
parts of its udder removed. We've already investigated cattle mutilations, and those witnesses have reported that orbs have been sighted in the areas where dead animals are found. All I can say is the light appeared almost nightly during this time period, and at the same time period, we were having cattle mutilations. What, what is your take on, on what happened uh, during that time? I wish I knew. Could the orb that Doug Schultz has observed for over a year be part of the orb colony that's terrorizing Site X? We need to analyze the video from Site X to see if there are clues to what it is. Jim. Oh, hi. Hi, thank you for seeing right. us today. Well, I've been analyzing UFO pictures for more than 20 years, and in the last 10 years, a lot of the attention has been on orbs, because that's what we see more often now than disc-shaped UFOs. Jim Delatoso of Spectrum Video has analyzed hundreds of UFO and orb videos. And what he brings to this investigation is a database created from previous investigations, a huge asset in trying to determine what these objects are and are not. It's like a, a police fingerprint database. You have a bunch of knowns. They're uh, planets, stars, airplane lights, flares. You have an unknown. You extract the data and try to get a match. If you get a match, you can say, well, these are flares. If you don't get a match, then it's absolutely unknown. Ted Phillips' video. The interesting thing to me was that it's two lights, they stay on, one's large and one's small, and then it becomes three lights. We can be sure that these lights are not an airplane. Well, airplane lights don't remain steady like that. The patterns of airplane lights are known. There's specific patterns that, that they need to be to, to come on and off. He says, absolutely, these are not airplanes, these are not helicopters. Uh, in his professional opinion, we're looking at something completely different. These lights, they're unique. We have this one light that plays back and forth between one light, two lights, one light, two lights. And that lasts for some number of minutes. Jim Dilatoso is analyzing Ted Phillips' footage, and he says the video isn't matching any known objects like conventional aircraft or flares in his database. But he is intrigued by what we're showing him, which means that maybe we're onto something. Can we say that this is definitely not uh, some kind of military operation going on there? I can't say whether it is or isn't a military operation, but I can say this is not flares because the lights don't modulate, they don't flicker, they don't change. If we built a graph, comes on, stays on, goes off. And what's a flare graph look like? A, f a flare graph is modulating frame to frame. The red, green, and blue content are all varying in relationship to each other, and the overall brightness, the luminance, is varying. So guys, you know, we've been hearing a lot about orbs. You've got the story of the little girl. Even though she experiences no bodily harm to this day as an adult, she will not go out at night alone on that property. What would you do if you lived in a community where these balls of light come out and, and somehow threaten you, actually make you feel threatened, unsafe? W would you be able to tell people about it without them thinking you were nuts, right? I mean, who would believe you? These stories are amazing because these are the signs of intelligence behind these balls. But we have to remember these are still just stories that we're hearing. Without actually getting to the site, you know, I just don't have enough yet. Site X isn't the only place where UFOs have a malevolent effect on those who see them. There's another hot spot where witnesses are reporting seeing orbs in conjunction with a dark presence. And it's a place we've investigated before, Kokomo, Indiana there was an orange light. 
What I observed that night were not any flares I've ever seen. You know, I think we have to use this information and let's bring that with us to Indiana. You're right, back to Kokomo. We're meeting with Glenn Meads, the Indiana State Director for MUFON, who's going to talk to us about these balls of light. Now they're proliferating, they've changed, and we want to hear what Glenn Meads has to say about it. What has been going on in Indiana? I know you're investigating it, MUFON's been involved in it. Just tell us what's going on.
It was a long, slow night, and we didn't see anything that couldn't be explained as dust, stars, or aircraft. But it was a really interesting experiment, including this paranormal team, and it's something that we may want to try again. I thought we had a really interesting time in Indiana. I mean, we heard lots of stories. Now we're going to Phoenix, and we are being inundated with hundreds of reports. People are seeing orbs all over the place. Like Kokomo, we've investigated Phoenix previously and heard nothing from witnesses about fear and nightmares. So something has changed, and I'm puzzled why these UFO reports have suddenly taken on this malevolence. I don't know if we're talking about a completely different type of orb here, or maybe the same orbs could be both demons and angels, you know, uh, a, a threat and benevolent. Arizona is one of the top hotspots in the world for UFO sightings, and most recently, orbs. Many reports are orange balls of light, much like the orb seen at Site X. People now claim there's a dark psychic connection to these orbs. I have on one occasion felt extreme fear uh, around an orb, and it's a feeling I never want to experience again. Christine Dickey has taken some incredible photographs of orbs around Casa Grande, Arizona, near the ancient observatory of the Hohokam. And Christine is telling us she's felt a dark presence that's manifested itself as malevolent premonitions, followed by actual orb sightings. What kind of feelings do you get? Well, it's kind of a feeling of excitement. It's like a, just a knowing and you feel excited, like something's out there. This is a feeling that you get before you have a sighting? Right. On September 10th, there was a huge thunderstorm building all day, and I got the feeling, so I went out and I started taking photos, and on top of one thunderhead, I got a UFO. Christine photographed this orb during a thunderstorm near the Casa Grande ruins, and it is indeed an incredible photograph. I'm not sure what it is, but it is interesting that she sees these orbs near this sacred site. I had an orb that was about that size, a little bit bigger than a basketball. This orb came down from the neighbor's house, down the hill, through the trees, stopped three feet from me. Now this thing is rotating, it's going back and forth as if it's scanning me. And I reached out to touch it and I heard a voice as clear as day say, don't touch it or you'll die. Arizona talking to witnesses who have seen orbs and felt a dark presence. In one case, an orb flew right up to a witness and confronted her. And I reached out to touch it and I heard a voice as clear as day say, don't touch it or you'll die. I jerked my hand back. The next thing I know, it's about 11.30 at night and I'm laying over the back of the bed and I rose up screaming bloody murder. I had no idea what, what just happened. And so I dismissed it as I must have laid down and fell asleep. And I had a really weird dream. Her story is similar to this testimony that Ted Phillips reported. Witnesses are being intimidated, threatened, and sometimes even attacked. Not all of the reports are like this, but it's a very disturbing trend that we're hearing. So I kept it to myself and then my neighbor came down and she said she was upset with her husband and she said he never believes anything I say, especially when I told him about the green ball of light and I said, excuse me? And she said, yeah, just the same night she was driving home from work, saw this green light come out of the clouds, down over our neighborhood and disappear into the trees. This is an example of the dark presence we're hearing more and more of in conjunction with the orb sighting. Unfortunately, a photograph isn't enough evidence to investigate fully, but we have someone who has multiple orbs he's captured on videotape. I think I do have a relationship to these orbs. I've been sighting and witnessing them for so long. I'm Jeff Willis, and I'm connected to these orbs.
Hey, Jeff. Hi, how you doing, Pat? How you doing, bud? It's been a long time. Jeff Willis is one of the most prolific UFO videographers in the Southwest. Now, he's videotaped dozens of incredible UFOs, including many orbs. In fact, one of his major sightings happened while I was standing right next to him, videotaping Jeff in action. I've been actually videotaping orbs and UFOs here in the Phoenix Valley since 1995, longer than anybody's been doing it. We've had the white ones during the day, the red ones at night, red lights, green lights, blue lights, you name it. Jeff is telling us that the reason that he captures so many orbs on tape here in Phoenix isn't by accident. He's a dedicated sky watcher that has struck gold many times. And he's also reporting these weird premonitions before he sees the orbs. I have had uh, like a strange feeling right before they show up where I thought, go outside right now. And I went outside and then a few minutes later something showed up. Like a psychic message, exactly. perhaps, that they're going to be there? Exactly. As a matter of fact, when I was on the mountain with you, when I shot the uh, four lights moving to the left... You got it, Pat? It was funny because I was standing right next to Pat and something told me, turn on, press record on the video camera. And I held my camera up and right away they started moving and I zoomed in and I happened to get it on tape. Whoa, I'm getting a series of lights right there. I got it, I got it, I got it. It's moving. How big was the object? I would say they were probably, uh, you know, smaller than these jetliners that come in and out of Sky Harbor. And they just appeared to be, you know, big balls of light that just hovered in the sky very slowly. What do you think you're looking at? What do you think these objects are? I mean, really, to tell you the truth, I don't know. It seems that the orbs that Jeff Willis has taken are very similar to the ones that witnesses are seeing in Missouri and in Indiana. But is there a dark presence to them? Or is it something more benevolent? How have your sightings been going lately? The activity is intensifying and it is more dramatic, really. I mean, the objects seem to come a lot closer now and a lot lower. Well, this matches what Ted Phillips told us that the orbs have moved from high in the sky and are being seen just above the ground. So we need to have Jeff's footage analyzed by Jim Delatoso. So of the Jeff Willis videos that we're looking at, this one right here is most interesting to me because of the lights and the apparent structure. We have a program that we use that measures the relationship of the lights one to the other to a reference point on the ground. This has structure to it. It had edges. They're like other structured V-shaped objects that we have in the daytime and in the nighttime. Jim is telling us that Jeff Willis's orbs are in fact a V-shaped triangle craft of some kind. That matches Roger Lamberson's Indiana string of orbs. So there does appear to be some pattern developing regarding these orb sightings. The reflection versus light emitting filter test that we ran mm -hmm. said that this is not reflecting the sun, this is light emitting. That's a key thing to know about this particular object, that this is light emitting, not light reflecting. Even a bright or a dim light is going to have a, a, a flare around it. Jim reminded us that any kind of light source will have a blooming effect when it's videotaped. But these orbs don't seem to have that blooming. And that's curious. It means that the objects are generating their own light. And it doesn't seem to be like light sources we would see on a tape if it were a conventional aircraft. This object has the same pattern of lights coming on and going off as other videos that we've seen. And if we graphed it out and compared it to other orb sightings, the graphs will be similar if not identical. 
So Jeff Willis's orb video is very similar to the footage that Ted Phillips provided to us. They both appear to be generating their own lights. That sounds like a craft with intelligence behind it. And Jim shared a very interesting trend that he's seeing with the orbs over Arizona. This is a map that I know will be of interest to you, and it's of different sites in Arizona that are sacred sites. Some of them have petroglyphs on them, and clustered in and around them are places where people have either reported lots of orbs or have videotaped them. I would suggest going to some of these sites and taking someone with you that can interpret petroglyphs mm -hmm. and see if the petroglyphs have orbs in them and uh, match them up to some of the, the videos that have been shot recently or even sometime past of these orbs. We're here in Arizona investigating the orb phenomenon, and we just got a lead that maybe the orbs have been around a lot longer than we first believed. Look who's here, guys. Look who's Giorgio. meeting us. Giorgio. You got it. Giorgio Sukales is the publisher of Legendary Times magazine. He's one of the foremost experts on sacred sites, archaeoastronomy, and the ancient astronaut theory. And he's come to Phoenix to assist in our investigation. We've been told that the orbs that we've been investigating somehow have a relationship to these mountains, these petroglyphs, and the people who lived here, the ancients who lived here thousands of years ago. It seems as if these orbs have clustered around these specific sacred sites. And the question is, what really went on a long, long time ago? Those petroglyphs not only exist here in the United States, but also in South America, in Europe, Africa, all over the place. And I've always been very intrigued at the uncanny similarity between all these different petroglyph sites. So, Georgia, what do you think came first, the, the orbs and the UFO activity or, or the ancient sites? Definitely the orb activity, because that is what Native American legends tell us that their whole civilization, if not the entire planet, was seeded by the gods, or as they call them, the Kachinas, the teachers from the sky, the all-knowing ones. The Kachinas are said to have taught the Native Americans everything. So it's interesting to hear that they saw things that they couldn't explain in the sky, but it is possible that meteors and the movement of the heavens played tricks on them and they simply misinterpreted what they saw. And here we are, I mean, check out all these paintings, these petroglyphs right here on the wall. The, the spiral is an often seen motif in many of these rock walls. And some have suggested that it is basically uh, a representation of our spiral galaxy. We're told, oh, it's all coincidence, and I choose to disagree, because someone, the Kachinas, told the Native Americans about the cosmology of our own solar system. What we have right here is two human beings, and they're both pointing to the sky, and up here we have two orbs that are floating above them, and as is often reported, whenever these orbs showed up, the Kachinas the teachers from the sky also appeared, and they taught mankind in mathematics, in agriculture, in engineering, all these different things. Giorgio says that the ancient Native Americans saw orbs, or UFOs, and that they were craft visiting from another solar system. It's possible that their descendants are the same orbs that are being seen today. What Indian tribe is native to this area? The Hohokam tribe, and the Hohokam means the vanished ones, because just like the Anasazi, they mysteriously disappeared. 
and all we're left over with is walls like this one here. The challenge is to actually decipher what the ancients are trying to tell us. And we know that the Hohokam tribe who carved these ancient petroglyphs and built this ancient observatory at Casa Grande apparently disappeared from the face of the earth. Is it possible that the message in these depictions might point to their disappearance? Well, what's the relationship between these petroglyphs and the orbs that we've been talking about? Do I think that the orange orbs were anything spiritual in nature? No, I think it was flesh and blood extraterrestrials and our ancestors misinterpreted those visits as divine in nature, even though it was not. We have so many people telling us so many different things about what they think these orbs are. And I think there are natural phenomena that are going on on the planet Earth. And I wouldn't be surprised that if in 50 years we have a scientific explanation for what these balls of light are. I think the reason that the quantity of orb sightings and videos are increasing is because people often have a video camera in their possession. People are seeing orbs. Maybe they protect this planet. And when we get out of line, they, they come and have a word with us and make sure that we, we stay on the right track. It seems that a level of psychic communication is happening here that involves dreams and premonitions that are so disturbing to us humans because we've lost the ability to rely on our senses. And maybe we need to listen to what these orbs are saying. If the Hohokam encounter the orbs, it doesn't bode well for our future. So, I mean, you have this relationship, not new, going on right today in the Ozarks with Ted Phillips sites. And the story of the little girl who was confronted by the orb right in her face, something is going on here. One thing is pretty clear, orbs have been our past and orbs will be our future. And if we keep looking up, maybe we'll see something. I think the dark presence is an omen that a quickening has begun. We've ignored these contact events for hundreds of years, and maybe now that the evidence is mounting, we finally see an acknowledgement that we are not alone. And we better pay attention to events that have long been documented or face a similar fate that the ancients met. The documentary featured an extensive summary of the footage, the canisters containing the footage, and expert analysis from the likes of Stanton Friedman. One film expert noted in the documentary that the footage came in an old Soviet canister that had information labeled on it that was consistent with info written directly on the film reel. The numbers on the film's header matched the canisters they came. The header of the film had the crest of the KGB on it and the term for T.O.P. secret is shown in the first few seconds of this footage and image to the right. Having real-looking alien footage is one thing, but including the original film real canisters means you are extremely close to proving 100 authenticity. This is something that has traditionally lacked in other more popular alien videos such as the widely known alien autopsy or the alien interview videos. Three. Several KGB documents In the documentary, several KGB documents are produced to prove the film is authentic along with credible testimony from a former Soviet KGB operative who claims to know about the event. At first everyone believed that those debris were part of some novelty aircraft manufactured in the United States or England, said Pavel Klinchenkov a former KGB operative, but having done some measurements material analysis. We came to the conclusion that none of the domestic or foreign manufacturers known to us could have produced this apparatus, at least not in the conditions existing on this planet. Along with Pavel's testimony, authentic KGB top-secret documents were obtained by the filmmakers. Allegedly costing them $10.000, the documents described in detail a crash site recovery operation of a disc-shaped object and organic remains. Based on the credible testimony, KGB documents, expert film analysis and the general good feeling one gets when watching this interesting crash site video, it is safe to assume that this film indeed may be authentic. What about the autopsy? This footage will be posted in our second part article along with thoughts and analysis, actors, training exercises, 
Skepticism, some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Another theory suggests the film was a training exercise. Yet no one has produced witnesses verifying this claim. One skeptical viewpoint suggests that the object's thickness is far too small to support any would-be alien pilot. The craft's outer edge is seen on the image is only 12 to 36 inches. However, it is not necessarily indicative of the overall thickness of the craft. The image was taken from the only part in the video sequence where the craft's edge is visible, and since the camera never goes behind, there is no way to tell how much depth the craft may have on the other side. Additionally, if you consider the side facing us may be actually be the bottom, we can easily see that this craft can easily fit the traditional flying saucer ship as demonstrated by the below images. In this documentary they claim that, since they only were able to acquire four canisters of film, more film footage of this incident is available. Such as the entire digging, cleanup, and inside the craft investigation. To this date, almost a decade after it went public, no other videos have surfaced. A UFO crash site allegedly filmed by the Russian KGB in March of 1969 in the Sverdlovsk region of Russia. The footage was later obtained by documentary filmmakers who then published the movie, The Secret KGB UFO Files A film expert noted in the documentary that the film came in an old Soviet film can and the numbers on the film's header match the cans they came in. The header of the film has the crest of the KGB on it and the term for TOP secret. An autopsy of the alleged pilot of the UFO is seen in the documentary film. Soviet doctors examined the burnt torso of the entity and it is revealed that the three doctors died one week later all from cerebral hemorrhages. Death certificates are presented as proof. Several KGB documents are produced to prove the film is authentic. Some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Another theory suggests the film was a training exercise. Yet no one has produced witnesses verifying this claim. UFO aliens may have helped build pyramids of Giza says. Cairo University Archaeologist Head of the Cairo University Archaeology Department, Dr. Ela Shaheen in December 2010 had told an audience that there might be truth to the theory that aliens helped the ancient Egyptians build the oldest of pyramids, the Pyramids of Giza. On being further questioned by Mr. Marek Novak, a delegate from Poland as to whether the pyramid might still contain alien technology or even the UFO with its structure, Dr. Shaheen was vague and replied I cannot confirm or deny this, but there is something inside the pyramid that is not of this world. Delegates to the conference on ancient Egyptian architecture were left shocked, however Dr. Shaheen had refused to comment further or elaborate on his UFO and alien related statements. Down below is 90s The Secret KGB UFO Files documentary, that deals with the fact that Russian had already discovered the tomb of alien humanoid in Egypt and something is beneath the pyramid. The secret KGB UFO files documentary interestingly supporting the head of the Cairo University Archaeology Department, Dr. Ela Shaheen claim as well. Actually ancient Egyptian writings very often talk of beings from the sky, the sky opening and bright lights coming down to teach them technology and give them wisdom. Many pictures and symbols resemble UFOs and aliens. Possibly aliens built the Great Pyramid. And these solid long-lasting construction techniques were adopted by the Egyptians. Ancient Egyptian legends tell of Tebzepi, or the first time.
This is described as an age when sky gods came down to earth and raised the land from mud and water. They supposedly flew through the air in flying boats and brought laws and wisdom to man through a royal line of pharaohs. And of course, this was all thrown out the window when Christianity came along. Keep in mind that the gods were the one and only religion that there was. No other conflicting beliefs? Why? Well because it was fact, not faith. The modern church would have you believe that it's just a myth. But you have to ask yourself on the edge of Oakham Razor, what truly indeed is more likely? There has always been the question. How did the Egyptians feed and care for the 100,000 s slaves that it would have taken to build the ancient structures like that of the pyramids in Egypt? One minute it is a very backwards country and almost overnight a highly advanced and technological culture sprung into existence. We now have the answer to that very question and evidence that the Egyptians had help extraterrestrial help at that. Thanks to Russia, the KGB and a top secret project called Project ISIS. Astrophysicist, neurologist and science advisor and advanced propulsion system gained access to the files of Project ISIS. This was a top secret project brought about by KBG concerning the discovery of the Tomb of the Visitor in 1961. Up until Sci-Fi purchased this exclusive footage from an agent of the Russian Mafia, it had never been seen outside the top secret facilities of the KGB. Sci-Fi showed it one time on television and as it stands today, no evidence of this film or the project is available. Except what we have copies of here given to us by a client that had taped the original show. This video is a, a, a powerful documentary with actual footage filmed by the KGB and verified by specialists in the field. Authentic film footage. If we can somehow bring attention back on Project ISIS and prove it out, it will change the history of the beginning of the civilization of man. During the Cold War, Nikita Khrushchev was determined to show the world that communism was superior over the democracy. As he realized that it would be too costly to compete with the U.S. in the space race, Khrushchev chose to go the other route. Having over 300,000 agents in the secret police and espionage organizations he focused most of this resource on alternative science, such as paranormal phenomena, psotromedic weapons, biogenerators and mind-altering machines. 1920s during the Stalinist regime, a dark room was created where the KGB conducted psychotronic weapons research on prisoners sentenced to die in political dissidence. After 1936 these files were transferred to the secret archives of the KGB, continuing on with their paranormal research. Khrushchev achieved great success with his biogenerators and machines to alter human minds, which worried, naturally, the United States, knowing that the Soviet Union was there to conquer and overthrow. Russia, being that its borders surrounded the largest landmass of the world, had the largest amount of UFO sightings. If they could capture one of these flying objects and reverse engineer it they could have the greatest advanced aeronautical designs. They got lucky in January 1986 when a spacecraft crashed in Dalgorsk but remained intact. The craft was back engineered and the process was quite successful. But to achieve the most superior advancement in global domination, they went in search for something that was only a rumor or legend. The Chamber of Knowledge in Egypt If the legends were true, storehouse of knowledge left behind by ancient visitors from outer space was concealed in the Great Pyramid. A team of archaeologists were composed of Egyptologists from the Russian Soviet Academy of Science, was sent to Egypt. The fearing that the CIA would learn of this expedition, the Kremlin operated with complete secrecy. By the late 1950s Egypt accounted for 43% of all the Soviet aid for third world nations. When they started the ISIS project the Soviet military personnel in Egypt was estimated over 20,000. The heavy military presence was used to disguise the efforts of the mission scientist headquartered in Cairo. They would operate under the guise of Arab peasants or Russian officers. To speed things up, in 1959 the KGB recruited professional informationalists to wiretap Egyptian officials. This paid of in July 24, 1961 a conversation was recorded that would then change myth into reality. The official had been given a call that two Bedouin had stumbled upon the tomb of the visitor. The Bedouin were in the hospital and kept repeating, the visitor God. At this moment in time, 
Project ISIS became top priority and all efforts were made to immediately follow up by having the Bedouin show them where they had found this tomb. SEIFI was able to purchase several documents and film footage as to the KGB documentations of their findings. Taken out of Egypt and brought to the secret facility of the KGB was this. Memo to high-ranking KGB official. My agents had secured the notes of one of the scientists working on the tomb of the visitor findings. Another was the inventory of contents taken from the tomb as follows. Location of finding. Undisclosed. 15 crates of relics, 1 partially mummified body, 1 stone sarcophagus, 8 hieroglyphic samples. Old report from a project scientist that was one of the first to enter the tomb. During the inspection of the wall segment we noted that a strange magnet repulsive force seemed to be emanating from the rock. We were unable to find any scientific explanation cryptologist report. Partial decoded message on tomb wall indicating a prophecy of the return of the winged gods. The Kremlin took the cryptologist report very seriously. KGB was ordered to determine target locations e planets, stars, galaxies. They had to duplicate the stars as they would have been over Giza thousands of years ago. They finally found it, in the stars and constellation of Orion during the year 10,500 BC. Although it was possible that the builders could have been working off plans of a time before the pyramids was constructed this was proven not to be the case. Metal and synthetic materials of tomb were determined to be of unknown origin and the tomb was carbon dated giving it a dating of 10,500 BC meaning the pyramid had to have been made at 10,500 BC. Kins of film were purchased by SEIFI through the Russian Mafia agent which originally came from the maximum security archives of the KGB. These kins contain film of KGB filming the process of the tomb and sarcophagus being opened. Sci-Fi had this film analyzed before purchasing by experts in this field. Finding no evidence of fraud, SEIFI purchased kins of film. The documentary is in black and white showing soldiers entering the tomb without gas masks. As they opened the sarcophagus, you can see toxic fumes escaping and the reaction of the soldiers as they were being affected. It also shows the mummy contained inside. The film shows the soldiers leaving the tomb fast and then a chemical warfare specialist team comes in with protective clothing. There is talk from one that was there in the tomb, that the energy inside, during the first days of exploration was very very high. They also had a team of psychics go in and do some special readings of the tomb. It later goes on to show the KGB and Bedouin loading trucks with crates to be shipped back to Russia. According to KGB documents, researchers began to wonder if the pyramid was designed for one particular purpose. They thought it was possibly a machine, being that it was designed like a three-dimensional triangular depiction of a hemisphere. Their thoughts were there must have been a reason why it was designed for resonating with the planet. Their thoughts went to a prism and that the pyramids have powers to alter the cosmic rays, that the pyramids are huge prisms capable of concentrating energy, capturing light from the stars which would initiate a process which would turn the pyramid into an interstellar transmitter. The three pyramids and SPHNIX could be integral parts of an immense machine designed by alien engineers linked by a master control mechanism inside the Great Pyramids. They noted that the passageway goes to main chamber. And above the sarcophagus was a tunnel of star shaft. They reasoned that when a specific star alignment occurs a streak of energy goes down the shaft. Scientists speculated that the radiant energy hitting the sarcophagus could initiate something similar to a cold fusion reaction. The prism structure of the pyramid would then magnify and transfer to the corresponding pyramids. A united beam of energy could erupt creating a cosmic beacon used by alien starship for future navigating. According to ancient legends all around the world, they all have the same thing in common. The visitors were like men but more like gods. They were giants. They traveled among the stars. They brought us the knowledge. Legends of the first emperors of China were called the Sons of Heaven and made the first pyramids of China. Mexico and Yucatan have similar legends. Star walkers can be found throughout Egyptian texts and s. American folklore. The visitors are described as the giants man slash gods giants or titans. And it seems.
All cultures may be traced to a single parent civilization could it be E.T.? Later on in the documentary, it shows them working on the mummy attempting to give it a face and identity. A computer projection of the mummy was made as it laid in the sarcophagus. Experts that were there to observe the fluorescenic reconstruction of the face described to sci-fi that if they had not been there themselves, they would not have believed what the face revealed after reconstruction. When skull and face was completed, it showed a humanoid type large cranium large eyes, small chin. Small teeth but not earth humanoid but some being that had to have been extraterrestrial. Later, using underground radar technology, the KBG found a passageway under the tomb of the visitor directly below was a large chamber. They believed they found the chamber of knowledge, but was afraid to open the tomb, thinking it could be a Trojan horse capable of blowing up the entire planet. They decided to seal the tomb, wipe away the location of the tomb and close the project. It seemed however that all were affected by the discovery. Some had personality changes. Some disappeared entirely others committed suicide and others no longer could support their old religious beliefs. The first official report of sightings, that we are aware of, was by King Tutkramaniya about 3400 years ago. Sightings continued through the ages. Sightings seemed to pick up with man mastered the skies. But when we conquered the inner workings of the atom, the aliens of Orion stepped up their observation with an explosion of UFO sightings that continue up to the present. UFO abduction reports began to sweep around the world in the early 60s. A pattern was developing with nearly all abductees reporting physical examinations, insertion of objects, and artificial inseminations. Many women abductees believe they were being impregnated to give birth to alien hybrids. In the last decade reports such as these have risen dramatically. It may be highly likely that the genetic colonization program that started back in the ancient times has resumed. The question was asked could they be cloning themselves by implanting their alien genes into human na? Are humans being transformed into an alien species through genetic engineer? The ancient Egyptians have always said that our DNA came from the heavens and that someday they would return. Did the KGB discover the truth in the chamber of knowledge about the true agenda of the it? And what was discovered on the wall of the tomb of the visitor prophesies that they would return. But when? Secrets cannot be contained. Not even KGB secrets. A group of scientists, computer programs, doctors, etc. shortly after the discovery of the tomb of the visitor, came together to discuss the possibilities of this discovery. They fully believed that the visitor was none other than Osiris, the alien king. Thus they gave themselves the name, the followers, based off the followers of Horus in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. According to Egyptian beliefs a family of gods came from the stars to Egypt. They were the ones that gave the people of Egypt the knowledge and wisdom. Later they left Earth back to their star homes, except for Osiris. He stayed and taught the followers. It was their duty to protect and keep the ancient knowledge he gave them until his return. The Egyptians were astronomers and fully understood that the stars were the map to the great god Osiris and the afterlife. Earned followers would secretly come together in their homes to discuss the possibility of the return of Osiris. They believed that the second coming of Osiris would herald a new age for mankind. They believed that when the tomb was discovered and the seal was broken, a signal was transmitted to the visitors. They calculated and estimated the time it would take for the electromagnetic signal to reach the constellation of Orion. They figured that they could return no earlier than April 23, 1985. With that time frame in mind, the group left Russia and took off to Egypt. Never to return. The only remains left behind of their meeting with the visitors was a newspaper clippage found in the KGB archives of a group of tourists disappearing in the middle of the night in Egypt, 1985. And one home movie project with film. This film showed the group in front of the pyramid at night. It shows a light appearing in the sky, the group dropping to their knees in prayer the light becoming brighter and then nothingness. A daughter of parents that were part of this group was shown the home video by the SEIFI team, of which she recognized her parents and burst into tears. 
Did anyone happen to see a documentary on sci-fi called Secret KGB UFO Files? I happened to catch this yesterday and why I'm leaning to the side of skepticism. I have to admit that it was intriguing, basically the story goes. In the early 60s the KGB discovered a tomb at the Giza Plateau containing an ever. Luckily there was film footage haha. -ha. The grainy film contained footage of archaeologists dressed in KGB gear opening the tomb of what was thought to be an ancient Egyptian king. When they do, toxic smoke overcomes one of them and the other two run out. It is later learned that the body isn't human. The footage looked as if it had been produced to look old, also. Included were shots of psychics levitating in the tomb. One thing that caught my attention is the archaeologist that was supposed to have been claimed by the toxic smoke was later helping move creates of evidence down some stairs. Despite the curious film footage, the documentary was very interesting and had me glued from the jump. Five decades, American agencies have stockpiled information on UFOs. So did their counterparts behind the Iron Curtain, soldiers, scientists and spies all paint a disturbing picture of the KGB's secret campaign. Is this the stunning proof that the Soviets recovered something not from this earth? When US researchers began looking into just how much the Soviet government knew about UFOs and extraterrestrial visitation, they were not surprised to learn that the Russians took the subject very seriously. What they didn't expect was evidence of ancient alien visitation, paranormal properties associated with related artifacts, and most shocking of all, of a mass abduction in 1985, among the piles of materials obtained from former Soviet spies. Some extremely puzzling and disturbing documents and film footage surfaced confirming rumors, which had been circulating for decades, in the late 1950s and 60s. The Russians became very interested in a number of unusual and newly discovered archaeological sites in Egypt by interpreting ancient symbols. One of those sites was believed to contain the remains of a life form not from Earth. Startling top secret film footage, never before seen outside the Kremlin, confirms the Soviet mission to recover an.